If you've ever found yourself believing that all African players are strong and athletic, it's probably because of this man, Didier Drogba. In his heyday, he was as tough as they came. I mean, he could receive a long ball on his chest while holding off two defenders, spin them around, and finish past the goalkeeper. Easy. And on the biggest stage, Drogba always delivered, scoring 10 goals in 10 finals, and retiring as one of the most clutch footballers the modern game has ever seen. But as incredible as his career was, his journey was even more impressive, fleeing poverty, overcoming rejection, and constant doubt on his way to the top. This is the life of Didier Drogba. Growing up in a time when the economy of La Côte d'Ivoire was falling apart, Drogba's parents were facing a struggle to take care of him. Even with remittances from his uncle in France, they couldn't see a way to provide for all his needs. Their jobs in the banking sector were barely bringing in anything. So, when they saw that many people were leaving the country for greener pastures, they decided to do the same. But there was a problem. They only had enough money for one person to travel. And in the end, they chose young Didier as the one to go. Imagine flying all the way to France at the age of five, with only a sign strapped around your neck that reads, Didier Drogba to meet Michel Goba. Nevertheless, his uncle was waiting for him when he landed. He'd been asked to put him in school even though he had hoped that Drogba would join a football academy instead. Being a semi-pro footballer himself, Michel Goba felt that Drogba could make it in football if he started early. After all, it was through football that Goba was able to come to France in the first place. But he respected the wishes of Didier's parents and enrolled him in school, allowing him to only play for the school's junior football team. Despite his uncle's efforts to make Didier happy, the young boy struggled to adjust. He was missing his parents and he kept begging them to allow him to come home. Reluctantly, they agreed. As happy as he was, the country was still in economic turmoil, and within three years of his return, both of his parents lost their jobs. Once again, they had to turn to his uncle Goba, who begrudgingly invited him back to France. This time around, he had leverage over them. He was going to make Drogba take football more seriously, starting with changing his position from right back to striker. He told him, people only care about the strikers. You need to play up front. Drogba was still schooling at that time, having to juggle football with his academics. His parents were still not happy about this, especially when they learned that he'd failed his exam and had to repeat the entire school year. So, when they finally joined him in France, they banned him from football. A year later, his uncle stepped in again and managed to convince them to allow him to return to the football pitch. Afterwards, he connected him to Levallois SP, a youth football club. At Levallois, Drogba began showing signs of a great player, but a serious body injury ensured that the bigger teams forgot about him. Le Mans, however, was still interested and offered to sign him after his injury layoff. Unfortunately, he suffered three serious injuries in his first two years at the club, leaving his family in doubt as to whether he could actually make it in the professional game. This doubt will make them encourage him to focus on his education, and by the age of 21, he would acquire a degree in accounting, ready to leave football behind once and for all. But then, out of nowhere, Le Mans offered him his first ever professional contract. It didn't make sense. He had played only two games in the previous season, but here he was, being given an opportunity to sign a contract he by no means deserved. He quickly accepted before they changed their minds. He was now a professional footballer. I wish I could say that he miraculously became injury-free after that. Sadly, that wasn't the case at all. Only seven goals in his first season before missing the entire pre-season of the next one. His body was just not used to consistent training and weekly football games. Naturally, he struggled a lot in the next season and ended up becoming a bench warmer. His third season was not much better, so you can imagine the surprise at Le Mans when Gwingamp bid for him in the winter. They immediately sanctioned the sale and allowed the then 23-year-old to leave. Drogba was failing upwards. He was now in the top tier of French football, but he knew that sooner or later, he'd have to start delivering. 
Football at the highest level was unforgiving, and Gwingamp were facing a relegation battle. Even though he scored on his debut, he still needed time to adjust. Thankfully, the team stayed up in the league without relying too much on him. The fans understood that he was only a January signing, so no pressure was placed on him. The following season, Didier repaid their patience with 21 goals in 39 games, propelling them to their best ever finish in the league, 7th place. At 25 years old, he had finally arrived. He was now a regular starter for the Ivorian national team and one of the most feared strikers in France, but he knew that time was not on his side. He needed to become a mercenary if he wanted to play in the biggest competitions before he retired. Gwingamp had only paid €150,000 for him, so they could make a lot of profit if they sold him in this kind of form. And that's exactly what they did when Marseille came called with a 6 million bid. The fans were not happy, but football is a business. They were not going to turn down 6 million for a player who obviously wanted to leave. Drogba had gotten his move to a Champions League club and was now prepared to show the whole of Europe what he could do. In the first round of the group stages, he would score against all three teams that were in Marseille's group. One against Real Madrid, one against Porto, and three against Partizan Belgrade. Sadly, he could not replicate this form in the second round, so Marseille had to settle for third place and drop down to the UEFA Cup. But Drogba was not done. He set the UEFA Cup ablaze with six goals in six games, single-handedly dragging his team to the finals. On the way, he had a lot of successes against English defences, scoring braces against Liverpool and Newcastle. Regrettably, he would be denied his first chance at silverware, as their goalkeeper, Fabian Barthez, got himself sent off while giving away a penalty in the final. The promising cup run had ended in tears. Nevertheless, Drogba had proven to himself that he was now an elite striker. More so, an opposition manager from the Champions League group stage had also noticed it. His name was Jose Mourinho. Just like Drogba, Mourinho was having his breakthrough season in Europe, leading Porto all the way to the finals of the Champions League. Billionaire owner of Chelsea, Roman Abramovich recruited him as head coach and was looking to add a host of big-name players to his team. So when Mourinho mentioned Drogba as his preferred striker, Mr. Abramovich was left bemused. Who was this player? What has he achieved? And does he cost 25 million euros? To this, Jose replied, Mr. Abramovich, pay. Pay and, and don't speak. He did, and in the next month, Drogba left Olympic Marseille, a cult hero with 32 goals in his only season at the club. Mourinho had gotten his man, but it would take Roman Abramovich many years to be convinced of the Ivorian's talents. In fact, over the course of Drogba's stay at Chelsea, Abramovich would consistently bring in new strikers he felt were better than Drogba. Despite helping Chelsea to win the league in his first two seasons and scoring an extra-time goal to clean the Carling Cup against Liverpool, Abramovich brought in Ballon d'Or winner Andrei Shevchenko to rival Drogba. In between these seasons, he had famously addressed the people of Ivory Coast and averted a civil war that was threatening to wreck the nation. He had earned the nickname the Champion of Peace from the media and fans. Life seemed pretty good until the club announced the signing of Shevchenko. After plundering 32 goals in his first two years at the bridge, he felt betrayed by the club. To make matters worse, he learned that Mourinho only signed him after Shevchenko rejected Chelsea's advances in 2004. Now that they had gotten their man, perhaps it was time to leave. He pulled out of Ivory Coast World Cup training camp to try and get a move elsewhere. But Mourinho was having none of it. He sat him down and assured him that he remained an integral part of Chelsea's attack, and he would pair them up front if need be. That season, Drogba played with an intensity never seen before in his career. He didn't know who to trust, so he had to make his case with numbers. By the end of the 2006-07 season, he had banged in 33 goals in all competitions, the most memorable one being that stunning chest turn and wallet winner against Liverpool in September. Shevchenko, on the other hand, could only muster 14 goals, setting him up as Drogba's backup or wide attacker when the two were on the field together. 
Drogba scored both goals in the Carling Cup final against Arsenal and the lone goal in the FA Cup final against Manchester United, bringing both trophies back to the bridge. He had overcome his inferiority complex. He was now the main man and remained so, even after Jose got the sack. Even when he wasn't on form, he was always there for the big moments. He scored Chelsea's only goal in the Carabao Cup final against Tottenham and the winning goal in the Champions League semi finals against Liverpool to set up 2008 Champions League final with Sir Alex Ferguson's side. It didn't matter what Abramovich did or who he brought in, Drogba kept delivering, whereas these great replacements struggled. On the African continent, people have begun attributing this phenomenon to Drogba seeking spiritual help from native doctors in his country to cast spells upon any new striker Chelsea bore. Shevchenko had failed, Pizarro scored only two goals and Anelka was stuck on the bench. Had they been any good, they would have been called upon when Drogba was sent off in the 2008 Champions League final. Shevchenko was even left on the bench for the entire 120 minutes of that match while defenders like John Terry and Ashley Cole were asked to play in the penalty shootout. It was only after that loss that Anelka found some form when playing in Drogba's position. And this was at a time where Drogba was injured for over five months. When Gus hit joined, Anelka was moved to the wings. And yeah, Anelka was still effective and this made the team even stronger. The trio of Drogba, Anelka and Maluda was too tough for many teams to handle. Had it not been for Ronaldo's Manchester United, they would have been winning every trophy with ease. It looked like these two teams were destined to meet again in the finals of the UEFA Champions League, when a late Iniesta strike in the semi-finals dumped Chelsea out of the tournament. In an incredible game where the energy of Chelsea's attack frequently overwhelmed the Barcelona defence, Pep Guardiola's side had to resort to fouls to contain them. Here's the crazy thing. The referee blew for every foul that happened outside the box, but not for a single one within it. Multiple handballs were caught in the replays, but the referee waved them all off. After the game, Drogba had to be restrained. He had lost it, constantly screaming to the camera. The season ended on a bittersweet note, however, with Drogba scoring as Chelsea clinched yet another FA Cup. 2009-2010 was a season that no one could have imagined for Didier Drogba. Approaching the twilight of his career, the 32-year-old delivered an astonishing 37 goals in 44 games. Led by Carlo Ancelotti, the team won the Premier League and the FA Cup with ease. And of course, Drogba scored in all the the crucial matches. That season was followed by a really poor year for the club as a whole, sparking rumours of a total rebuild by Roman Abramovich. In January of 2011, Drogba's final replacement would be signed. A certain... Even the most ardent Drogba fan would admit it, Torres was that good. For the first time, Drogba had even accepted that he would be the one to sit out among them. So, what happened? Fernando Torres couldn't score. Inexplicably, Fernando Torres just couldn't score. Into the next season, not much seemed to have changed. The team was doing well, but Fernando Torres just couldn't score. So, guess who had to come back into the lineup? Didier Drogba. He only only played in two group stage games in the Champions League, yet managed to score three goals and give one assist. But at 34, would he have it in him to drag this team to one last shot at the ultimate prize in club football? After the sacking of the much-heralded Villas Boas, many expected Roberto Di Matteo to just steady the ship till the end of the season so that a proper manager would be announced. But for Drogba, the time was now. His whole career seemed unlikely from the start. How about one more unlikely run? It started with an incredible comeback against Napoli, where he scored and assisted the winner in extra time. And then, against a familiar foe, he scored the only goal in the first leg as Chelsea carried the advantage to Camp Nou. The second leg proved tougher as Barcelona took a two-goal lead. However, Chelsea's luck changed when Messi missed a penalty, Ramirez scored, and Torres scored on a counter-attack, securing their spot in the Champions League final against Bayern. 
Everton. Chelsea were far from favourites once more, and though they held on for a while, when Muller scored in the 83rd minute, it appeared to be a done deal to most, but not Drogba, who scored in the dying moments to keep Chelsea going. This was the most important goal of his career. Czech saved the penalty in extra time, Schweinsteiger failed in the shootout, and Drogba was there to take his spot, securing Chelsea's European title in what would be Drogba's last appearance for the club. What a befitting end to such a great career. Yeah, 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 I know what you're thinking. He moved to Shanghai Shenhao, to Galatasaray, and then back to Chelsea to win the Premier League again. But for me, on that night in Munich, Drogba's story was completed. All the hardship and difficulty had only ended up moulding him into the legend that he is today.